Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm Dr. John McClain, and uh, this will be the second uh, presentation on the uh, providence of God. And uh, there will be a number in this uh, series. And so let me open up the shared screen and uh, we can talk about the uh, providence, the sovereign providence of God. Now, I want to begin by talking about the word providence in the Bible and the word sovereignty in the Bible, because this is a biblically based discussion, not a theologically based discussion. So we have to be like an independent auditor or an independent attorney general. We cannot be a prosecuting attorney. We cannot be a defense attorney. We've got to take off our theological glasses and engage the scriptures and to uh, see what the scriptures have to say about our understanding. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up uh, a software package that I use all the time. I'm so very thankful for it. Logos Bible software. I'm not selling it. Uh, but I am recommending it for those of you who are engaged in Bible lessons and other things, uh, because it is so efficient and effective. And uh, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to bring up, uh, this is a word study uh, that the Logos of Bible software uh, is able to do, saving hundreds and hundreds of hours and providing good information, and uh, you can go on their website and, and look at it. Uh, really, to fully engage uh, Logos, you need to know uh, and know it well, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, but it is a great source uh, for all uh, those who want to rightly divide the word of truth. So this is the word of providence, uh, the search for it within uh, the uh, Old Testament based on the New American Standard uh, Bible, which uh, I find is the most representative uh, translation that I appreciate as their approach to translation, as well as their hermeneutics. Uh, but there are many good translations. I like the NET, I like the NIV, the New King James, uh, uh, there is no one translation that gets it all right. But uh, this is an example of words that are somewhat translated within the concept or the uh, domain, the word domain providence, all right? And uh, you can see, uh, if you were to pause the screen and look very closely, that there's really no single word or even major words that are translated providence. That's where I make the argument that uh, providence is more of a theological concept, hopefully based on exegesis, exposition of the scriptures, rather than a philosophical or a theological or logical arguments. Uh, not to say that uh, those are untrue, but those are all based upon a secondary level of examination, in my opinion, where the primary data is the scriptures. So here we see that the main concept of providence is supported by words like here in the blue, to make, to manufacture, to do, to perform something. Or uh, here in the red, to hold, to take, to contain, to uh, sustain. Now, in the Greek, uh, we see the same thing. The theological concept of providence is to make or to do. It does have uh, some aspects of foresight and forethought or for, uh, for provision to supply 
to provide. And as we look down at the New American Standard uh, translation of these words and things, you see that in the Old Testament, it's dominantly to provide something. And then as we get into the New Testament, the same idea of to provide, provide, provide. Over here is the one time that uh, the New American Standard actually uses the word uh, providence, but it comes from this idea of providing. And since by your providing reforms, so on and so forth. So uh, my main point is this, when it comes to providence, we don't have a, a singular word or couple of words in the Bible that we can focus on to get a definition. And therefore, once again, providence in most discussions is a theological uh, discussion that should be based upon what the Bible has to say. So this is the uh, New American uh, Standard, and uh, we just don't see that many uh, results of it. So I could look at the NIT, I could look at the uh, NIV, but really we're going to see uh, the same uh, kind of examples. And those examples are that uh, there is no, in a sense, a singular word uh, or couple of words that dominate what providence means or what the uh, theological discussions uh, build on for uh, all of these. So let me drop this search out and I'm going to go back and for instance, here's the Net Bible. And again, I like the Net Bible. It has uh, a lot of things to uh, show us. Uh, but once again, in the Old Testament, you see provide, provide, provide. And uh, in the New Testament, there are uh, very few uh, examples. So uh, that my main point is this. When it comes to providence, we don't have Bible words that in, are in the original language that provide us the opportunity to say, well, what does the, uh, the word, what are the, what's the concept, what's the best translation for the word providence? Now, the second one that I just want to show us here is sovereign or uh, sovereignty. Now, when it comes to the Old Testament, you see here's the Hebrew. Let me move myself out of the way a little bit here. There we go. And uh, it's related to a uh, kingdom, uh, kingship, a reign, a realm. There's the word sovereignty or a royal uh, dominion. And so we really have, although there's like three sections, they are all related to one Hebrew word uh, and the root of it, and, and that is the idea of reigning. But to reign or to be king or to be sovereign is used so much within the context of Israel as a nation. Now, notice here the Greek words. Uh, there are no Greek words specifically through the translators that are related to this idea of sovereignty. In other words, specifically translated sovereignty in the New Testament. Here's the New American Standard. You can see the really the few times uh, in the Old Testament, the uh, few times that we see uh, in the Net Bible, uh, only twice in the NIV. Now, I'm not saying that the concept's not there. What I am trying to say is that when it comes to Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek words, 
that translators have not found equivalence in the Old or New Testament that they would regularly translate the word sovereignty. And so my main point is that we are faced once again with the idea that providence and sovereignty are theological concepts that must be built upon uh, biblical verses, all right? So uh, if you, you know, want to argue with that, uh, that's okay. Uh, I've been uh, teaching these languages for many years. I've had the privilege of uh, being taught uh, these languages by uh, many, many of the literally best uh, teachers, and I'm open uh, to discussion. I'm open to other translators, uh, but providence and sovereignty are not concepts in the Bible that are founded upon explicit words in Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic. Therefore, we uh, provide uh, theological definitions or biblical definitions, and whatever makes you feel more comfortable uh, to relax in your seat. And uh, these are based upon the scriptures. Now, in my argument, I want to make the point that the attributes of God, all of the attributes of God, and the things that we know about God and his engagement and and relationship and plans of uh, his work with humanity are all part of uh, the discussion, the study of providence and sovereignty in the Bible. So I'd like to start, first of all, with, uh, I think, a statement that is true, and that is that God knows the days of life. Now, I don't say our lives, uh, because it is individual examples in Scripture upon which we build or cross the bridge to our lives. In other words, what God does for one person in the Scriptures does not prove that God does that for all persons in the Scriptures. What God bestows upon one person in the scriptures does not mean that God bestows all those things on all people. And that's a bridge that you have to walk across theologically. For instance, Psalms 139, 16. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Now, I, that's the New American Standard translation. Um, I love the New American Standard, but really this translation is, your eyes have seen my forming substance. Uh, it's that embryonic development. Uh, today in the whole discussion of when does life begin and when does the spirit soul enter into humanity and, uh, and is, is an embryo, a baby, unformed is not fair to the Hebrew text, nor to the discussion of this. It's your eyes have seen my forming substance, my developing substance or body. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Now, believing Psalms 139 may be written by David, may be written uh, by uh, Korah, may, you know, uh, that is something of a side discussion. The fact is that this psalmist says, this I know to be true of God's relationship to me. Now, that doesn't mean it's true for all of humanity. 
for the billions upon the earth and in history. It does mean that it could be true. Maybe it should be true. Maybe it is true. But you have to build a bridge over to that statement from other statements or for other understandings. Now, the next one is we have Job, an example of Job. Job 14.5 says, since his days are determined, meaning humanity, the number of his months is with you and his limits you have set so that he cannot pass. Now, this is a more general statement by Job, probably referring to humanity, humanity as a whole. So there is within God's sovereign providence an establishment of days, a number of months, a, a limit of life, uh, and this one, Although Job is citing it, and Job is probably uh, the first revelation of God to uh, humanity, uh, precedes uh, Genesis. It's uh, a patriarchal period or pre-patriarchal uh, period. You have this statement that one can build to all of humanity. And so it's important you have to look at well, what does determined mean? And his limits you have set. What, what kind of limits? Uh, limits on time, limits on behavior. Uh, and those are the things that you get out of the entire uh, book of Job. This is a general statement of, I think, all of humanity. Now, Galatians 1.15 says, Paul says, but when God, who had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, and the word even you can see is an italics, so it's added to the text, it's not there in the uh, words of the original manuscript, but it is there probably in the grammar. Uh, one of the things that I'm doing as I am translating uh, through the Bible for myself, uh, I find that uh, most of the translations into English are not translating the grammar as much. And that's for another discussion. Or when I get to posting uh, my translations on uh, YouTube, it will be underneath a separate category you can look at those and you can see what I mean by the translation of the grammar. But back to the subject. But when God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased, and then it goes on to talk about uh, God's will and influence and control of Paul. Now, this is very clear that, you know, before... God, when God had set him apart, who had set me apart, when did he do it? From his mother's womb. And he called him, called him to ministry, called him to salvation. You know, you have to look and say to yourself, what does called mean in Paul's book of Galatians? What does it mean in Paul's other epistles that were written about that time? Well, what does it mean throughout Paul's uh, didactic teaching letters, all right? Uh, what does the word called mean there? Because what called meant how Jesus used it, or Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John used it, uh, versus other authors, uh, every vocabulary has to be studied within the author's vocabulary or the author's writings or corpus. That's a great hermeneutical lesson I throw in for free. But it's very clear that God was sovereignly, providentially working on Paul when, even before or during the time that he was in his mother's womb. 
And again, we're not going to get off the track, but that certainly says something about the question of abortion. Now, here we have Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, before I formed you in the womb, Jeremiah recording the direct revelation of God to him. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. And I have appointed you a prophet to the nations. Formed, knew, consecrated, appointed. Very, very strong terms of sovereignty and providence. But the question still must be raised. Does what applies to Jeremiah automatically apply the same way to everyone else? Does what God says uh, or states to Paul, to Job, to Jeremiah, can you automatically say that applies to everybody? And my answer to that is no, I don't think you can. You know, uh, Judas is, an, uh, you know, another appointed person. And what does appointed mean? Does that mean that he will, Paul, Job, Judas, uh, Jeremiah, on and on and on, Isaiah, does that mean that their life will only be the sovereign providential acts of God's will or performance of God's will? Or is it specific to them and a general principle or something for all of humanity? I mean, what do we do about all the mistakes that Paul, Job, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, Judas, so on and so forth, uh, did? This is the tension uh, that we have to uh, live with. And we're, we have the sovereign providential work of God based on his attributes. And then we have the accountable, free will, responsible uh, actions of humanity uh, that we have to affirm also. And if you allow one to override or obfuscate the other, I think you are uh, over writing the clear uh, statements of scripture and that you will therefore uh, neglect a proper interpretation of uh, what the scriptures reveal and what God is doing. So we'll continue this uh, discussion. Uh, the main focus again is that providence and sovereignty are theological concepts that have to be based and built on biblical exposition.